Hello, I am happy once again to be joined with Julia Taliesin from the Somerville Journal for another news roundup with Somerville Media Center and the Somerville Journal. How are you doing, Julia? I'm good, Dave. Thanks. How are you? I'm doing all right. Uh, we were talking beforehand. There's a lot to talk about, um, particularly with the, the vaccine rollout. Um, but why don't we start off talking with, about uh, some, some of the latest COVID numbers, and then we can go from there. Sure thing. Thanks so much. Yeah, it's always good to start off kind of grounding ourselves in that data. Um, so as always, um, let's kind of take a look at the city data. They continue to consistently update that COVID data dashboard. Their website is a great resource for me and others. Um, so yeah, when we take a look at this, um, I think I've been finding this really helpful. Um, I think we all kind of, you know, knew that after, after Christmas, after the holidays, there was going to be a spike. And you can pretty clearly see that on the map, but thankfully, you know, whether or not it's going to remain sustained, um, you know, this is a tough time, it's winter, um, some indoor dining is still open, um, it's harder to see people outside, so some people may be gathering indoors, um, but regardless, things are moving down a little bit. Oh yeah, looking um, at these, so looking at these it, graphs, yeah, it looks like the exactly. graphs are going down a little bit. Yeah, so, so that's definitely hopeful. Um, you know, I think there's a number of factors, um, ho you know, hopefully, you know, vaccines have begun. That could be part of it. There may be like less healthcare workers um, getting sick. Mm. Um, as we know, you know, those, a lot of travel happened over the holidays. So those cases, I think kind of caused a spike and now we're seeing a uh, decrease from that. Um, so those are all good things. Yep, you can see here um, that January is on track to come in lower then, I mean, it's the, as we're recording this, it's January 28th. Um, and we do have a couple hundred cases lower than we did in December. So that's hopeful. Um, you know, hopefully we'll continue that downward trend, um, especially as, you know, there's, there's less travel and as vaccines continue, yeah. um, which we'll talk a little bit more about in a minute. Um, so yeah, as we've kind of continued to look at this, there's a number of helpful kind of indicators you can look at. Uh, if you keep scrolling down, um, I always just like to bring attention to the data around equity and distribution of cases in Somerville. This is one way to look at the way that different zip codes have experienced COVID impact. If you scroll down a little bit, we talked about these three maps last time, yeah. which are just really helpful. Yeah, when we're thinking about like who who is most impacted, who is facing the worst of this. Um, so kind of we got the zip code map, we got the heat map, and then they added that environmental justice population map, um, which when you kind of put it side by side is it's very clearly impacting people in vulnerable populations. Yeah. Um, so as you know, you know, we're looking at that, I think this is all really helpful in general as a kind of really top overview. We've now, you know, we're over 4,000 confirmed cases. Right now there are about 262 probable positive cases and we have had more fatalities. There are about, um, I think there are now 50 deaths reported. Yeah. Um, so just, you know, as a reminder, um, Things from oh, 59 deaths reported 59, yeah. um, as of the 27th. Thank you. So uh, things remain hard. You know, th it's great that, you know, the, the case rates are trending down. Um, it's great that vaccination rollout is underway. Um, but this is still impacting our neighbors, you know, and our, and our fellow our fellow residents. So I think yeah. it's really important for all of us to kind of stay vigilant um, and continue to just follow public health advice around masking. Um, social distancing. I last night saw my mother. I set us up with two chairs six feet apart on the porch. Um, had to shovel it off a little bit first. Um, and we kind of wore masks and I got a couple heated blankets out there. And that's how we spent about an hour together. <laughs> you know what I mean, so it's, it's a weird new world. Um, but there is, you know, there is some ways to do this. Yeah. Um, Obviously, some people like myself are privileged to have spaces like this, and it's much harder for others. Um, but just something to continue keeping in mind. Yeah. Um, but do you want to talk a little bit about vaccine stuff? Vaccine stuff. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> a lot, the, yeah the, the vaccine is available, um, is hopeful. What's a little less hopeful is uh, how the state has yeah. um, done with its with its first phase of rollout, um, which uh, has been noted, it's a little lackluster, especially compared to other states. Um, so what are you hearing, Julia? Absolutely. I think that's a good kind of summary of it. Um, I'd say, you know, again, we're recording this on the 28th. This is fresh news. Um, so, you know, a lot of, there's a lot we don't know when I've, you know, I was uh, speaking with 
um, Cambridge Health Alliance earlier today, there's a lot they don't know. Um, there are a lot of questions <laughs> around this, um, which I think, you know, this is the first kind of any part of the general public rollout before it was much more targeted in terms of healthcare providers who were working specifically in like COVID facing jobs and then moving on to those that weren't. But those are, you know, when you're vaccinating healthcare providers, there's, a, I think, a better, a easier system. You know, everyone's got IDs, you know, you're in a specific place. Um, so this is the, you know, the first step of like vaccinating the general population, which, you know, maybe it was bound to be tough. Maybe there could have been a better way. You know what I mean? I don't know, but either way right now, there are a lot of questions. Um, so kind of in that space, I would say that, you know, where we're at is, you know, at this point, people 75 years old and older are eligible to begin making appointments. Um, that began yesterday as we were recording this, um, that was January 27th. So I believe appointments begin uh, next week. So around the beginning of February, I think like February 1st, 2nd, 3rd, et cetera. Um, there are a number of ways that this is being rolled out. <laughs> mm. um, and I, it, it depends on kind of where you live. It depends on who your doctor is, what network they're part of, um, what city you live in. You know I mean? There, there are a lot of factors that go into this. So I think first, let's pull up that state map. Um, so the state does have a number of resources on their website. You know, if you're curious about whether or not you're eligible, um, if you're curious, like how the process works, you know, you can find, you know, what the phases are. Um, and you can also kind of check out this map to look at like what might be available in your area to start getting an idea of just what's out there. Um, so yes, thank you for pulling this up. So when you look at this, um, you'll notice there are different colored stars. So um, Dave, would you just scroll up a little bit? Not in the map, sorry, <laughs> on the page, a little bit more. Um, Cause they, they tell you um, right there, right there. So they tell you what each star means. So just wanna lay this out super clearly. Um, so those red stars, there are fewer of them. Those are mass vaccination sites. These are things like hotels, Fenway Park, is a mass vaccination site. Um, green stars are general vaccination sites, often healthcare locations. This may be a hospital, an urgent care center. It really depends, I think, on your community and the capacity they may have. Um, blue stars, general vaccination sites, pharmacies. I've seen uh, CVS, I've seen Stop and Shop. Um, you know, there are various, again, it completely depends on what what is available in that location in that community. And then yellow stars, which are local vaccination sites, which may be city halls, they may be council on aging centers. Um, again, it varies. So if we scroll back down to the map, um, you can see that, you know, there's a, some, a lot going on in Boston, but when you kind of zoom in on Somerville, there isn't something in Somerville at the moment. Um, while there are a couple things in Medford, right, you can see that this doesn't actually mention Somerville residents. Um, there are, I mean, we're very close to Metro Boston. We have some connections. So there are, you know, several, there's a mass vaccination site that's Fenway yeah. um, in Boston. And for example, I live in North Cambridge and my health network is Mass General Brigham. So, you know, I may be able to, you know, get a vaccine through that network. I mean, I'm, I'm far down the line, <laughs> um, right. but it depends on again, like what your health network is. Um, so, I know I'm saying it depends a lot. <laughs> so I wanted to kind of bring attention to this resource because I know a lot of people are just like, where do I start? Like, yeah. what am I looking for? So the state does have resources like this, questionnaires in terms of like making an appointment. What we've been hearing is that that's been really challenging, mm -hmm. that sites are either crashing or maybe you wait in a virtual line and then never get an appointment. Um, they're filling up really quickly. Um, so I think there's some kinks that are being worked out or will hopefully be worked out. Um, but, you know, hopefully, you know, expect more news like this is happening right now, you know, so expect more news, keep an eye out on things. Um, you know, if there are our seniors watching this, you know, and you're like, oh God, like how do how do I check on all this stuff? Like, 
if you have um, family members who can support you through this, you know, the city and state are recommending that you reach out to them. But if you don't, then the Council on Aging in Somerville and Somerville Cambridge Elder Services are there to support you. Give them a call. Hopefully you're already connected um, and they can help guide you through this process and answer more questions you have like on the phone, <laughs> you know what I mean, and help you a little bit more directly. Um, so this is kind of the state approach returning to the city. Um, again, you know, I, I found it really helpful to sign up for city alerts in this. Um, the city did send out an alert um, on January 10, 27th, which had a lot more information around this. Um, they pointed you in the direction of those state resources. Um, they talked about the timelines. You know, um, they warned people that, you know, there are a lot of kind of issues with rollout at the moment, but to kind of have patience and get in touch with people if you can. Um, you know, they noted that some healthcare providers like Cambridge Health Alliance, if you are a CHA patient, will be proactively getting in touch with patients. So if they haven't gotten in touch with you, it's because they don't have a dose or they don't have, you know, you're not next up. Um, I think, you know, you can call and have, ask questions, but they are like, their approach is that they are getting in touch with their patients as doses become available. Um, state website. Um, and then, like I said, there are resources, resources to assist you with sign up. Council on Aging and Central Cambridge Elder Services. And just to highlight kind of where the city's at, um, according to this alert, the city is receiving kind of an unpredictable, like unpredictable small shipments of doses. They initially got a, a shipment of about 500 doses to begin um, vaccinating police and fire, um, you know, and one, you know, first responders, et cetera. Um, and now they say they're promised, they've been promised about 100 doses a week but this could go up or down. Um, so at the moment, Health and Human Services is using these to help area health providers vaccinate their phase one eligible staff. Um, but they said they're gonna keep people informed about future local availability and they're advocating for more vaccines so that they can expand local access, especially to those who face the greatest barriers to vaccine access via the state system. So Somerville's kind of working on this, um, but it's not kind of happening quite yet. I guess. So definitely keep an eye out and sign up for city alerts if you can, phone, email, et cetera. Good advice. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, but we can, we were chatting a little bit about kind of where we're at in terms of like, na you know, national. Right. Um, so we, we found this cool kind of New York Times um, map, which shows, um, you know, a little bit of information about where Massachusetts falls. And, you know, again, Things are changing really quickly. Everyone's managing this differently. Um, but it is, you know, there has been news coming out that Massachusetts is lagging behind a little bit in, in terms of vaccinating our citizens. Right. Um, so if you kind of check this out, this is the, I think, percent of, popula percent of populations that, that's gotten at least one shot. Um, of course, when you keep this, when you kind of view this map, you want to like keep in mind that, you know, a percentage of a population depends on how many people are in that population. So, you know, there are a lot of people in California and not as many people in North Dakota. So maybe, you know, they've succeeded in vaccinating more people because there are fewer people. So just that's, you know, an important thing to keep in mind when you're viewing maps like this. But as you can see, Massachusetts is very light. <laughs> so um, we, we have not done much vaccination at this point. And and you, you can see that like Massachusetts is like, for example, on this, the same shade here, like which is according to this map is around 5% of the population uh, or under. And, uh, you know, I have relatives in Texas, I was, I was mentioning before the show and, uh, you know, some of some of my relatives who are 75 and older already have a, a second appointment on the books for their second dose. Um, and, and the rollout has been uh, much better in in Texas and in other states than uh, in Massachusetts, uh, which is which has been criticized. Exactly. That's actually something. Thank you for bringing that up, because that's another concern that people have that part of the state rollout is that they say, you know, when you make an appointment for your vaccine, that patients should be getting both doses at the same location. Mm which I think for some may present a challenge because if they have, if they are going, if they're going to be traveling to get that dose, you know, if it, there isn't anything available in their local community that can just present like pretty typical challenges in terms of transportation and timing and um, whether or not you have support available to you. If you're, you know, 
seeking support from an agency, like booking things in advance. And like, there's just more kind of logistics that can go in that. Yeah. Um, so that's another concern that people are sharing in terms of appointments. So that's a good thing to think about. Yeah. So this is again, another way to look at that. Um, where, where is Massachusetts? <laughs> where is Massachusetts in this? Um, yeah. So yeah, you do, 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 we're down. Yeah. Wow. Um, yep. 6.7%. Okay. Um, so again, another way to look at things. Um, and there was one other, if you continue scrolling down, I think there was one other graphic that I thought was interesting. Yeah. So this is kind of where people are at in terms of who is being vaccinated, which is just another way to kind of look at like how, how much of the population has begun, like have access to this vaccine. Um, so again, like, you know, this, this is, it's the very beginning, you know what I mean? So things will be changing with this, with, um, you know, with national response, state response. Um, there's also, we just had a change in national administration. We have a new president. He has promised, I think like a hundred million vaccinations before like April or before the end of April. Or um, So, you know, things might be changing because of that. There might be kind of a more centralized, you know, movement to, to get vaccines out there. So, you know, there, there's certainly a, uh, a more serious approach um, yeah. to, to the vaccine uh, rollout and uh, just in general to the response to, to COVID from a new administration. So um, I was also reading an article where they were essentially saying that they had to build this from the ground up, that the previous administration just didn't have systems in place. Um, so there is that to take to account. Uh, and then at, a, at the state level, you know, where where the state is making up for that or where it can make up for that, um, you know, going forward. Um, just a lot Absolutely. of things to look out for. Mm -hmm. um, and the advice is just keep up, make sure you're keeping up with the latest information uh, locally through the city's website, checking in regularly with the state, contacting your healthcare provider, reaching out to institutions like the Somerville, uh, Somerville, Cambridge, uh, the elder, elder services. services. Yes, yeah. Um, and, and similar organizations um, that you may be in touch with already as a senior. And um, yeah, information is key right now. So they will get information once the vaccine is available and uh, just check in with them regularly. Absolutely. Yeah. And so there, there is other news to talk about. Um, <laughs> as there, there was a, a statewide police reform bill that was passed at the end of last year. Um, and we've talked a little bit about the, the local impact on that. Um, so what, what, are, what are some of the developments locally with that? Sure. Yeah. So I just wanted to kind of bring attention to this because there's been so much local action, like you just said, that we've talked about before, um, that I think that, you know, there's some curiosity about the state bill and kind of what it might change, what it makes possible, um, but also kind of what we're already doing here and how things are progressing. Um, there, you know, because there's still, you know, if, if you're someone who watches the city council meetings, they're still checking in. You know, we haven't yet hired a director of racial and social justice. That was something promised during budget season. That is still ongoing. You know what I mean? So there's things you know still happening. Process is still in the works around beginning to, not even beginning to establish, beginning to have those community conversations that will drive the development of these reforms in Somerville. We're still there, and you know this isn't to bash you know anyone. It, we are in a pandemic. It's very hard to gather at the moment. Right. And, and to get community feedback in an efficient and engaged way. Um, so uh, this is you know, not, not to judge, it's, it's simply like, I think there's a lot, a lot going on. So um, the state bill, you know, it's, it was a big bill, um, you know, controversial in different regards, but it, it establishes some new and interesting things. So one thing that people have probably heard of is the like certifications and certification and decertification process. Um, that you know isn't something that is happening locally in Somerville. That's something that's going to be developed statewide. When I was chatting with the Somerville acting police chief and counselors, you know, this is something they felt hopeful about. You know, obviously things take time, especially at the state level. Um, but you know, this they you know they were hopeful about this you know being enacted and being effective in Somerville. Um, and right now there's kind of a, um, I believe like a kind of board. Um, it's a commission that's being established to then develop kind of the guidelines for um, certification and decertification. But like, as an example of how long things take, the first appointments to that commission are due by April 1st. 
So just the appointments to the commission. So it's, it's going to take time for yeah. this stuff to get up and running. Um, there's things like minimum standard of training for police officers, um, laws around um, duty to deescalate um, and regulating different kinds of force used, um, you know, making sure that officers, you know, band-aiding reporting. So if an officer witnesses a fellow officer do something illegal or, you know, overuse force, they have to report that. Um, around kind of protests and demonstrations and use of force. So like if you use rubber bullets, if you use tear gas, you, there's kind of like an extra report you have to file with this commission that's being established. So there's kind of just like more, more checks and balances being developed around this stuff, um, which, you know, it's again, it's all happening at the state level. But for example, in Somerville, Councillor Ben Ewan Campen and his colleagues have been working on legislation regulating the use of tear, well, banning the use of tear gas and regulating other uses of force like rubber bullets. Um, they've asked for an itin, like a kind of, um, not an itinerary, um, I'm completely forgetting the word, but basically a list of like all of the military equipment that mm. Somerville has in its possession. Yeah. Um, so there, there are, again, like there are questions being asked. They're trying to kind of figure out like, what does Somerville have? What do we need to regulate? Like, what things do we need to change? Um, so that work is ongoing kind of in the city council. Um, when I was speaking with the police chief, he, you know, he seemed really, you know, he, again, he's an acting police chief. If you remember, Who, um, David Fallon retired in December. Right. And this so is who's the, the acting was, police chief? Charles Femino. So he is a former SPD officer. Um, and he's going to be in the role um, as the city searches for a new permanent chief. Um, so he he was kind of, you know, he seemed really supportive about um, the kind of new things that the bill established. He said, you know, he, he thinks it's going to take time to, you know, to put all this in place and for kind of officers to adjust. But he said, you know, certification sounds great. More, more training sounds great. Um, and I think, he, you know, he seemed optimistic, um, but also noted that like a lot of work is already going on in Somerville around this stuff. So kind of beyond that, um, you know, the city council continues to work on developing civilian review. Um, I think we talked about this in a past roundup that two people were hired, a legislative and policy analyst and an outreach coordinator to support the city council. In, in developing um, legislation around civilian review and that is ongoing again very hard to conduct outreach, but they're trying. Yeah. Um, so all of these processes are just still underway. And I bring this up because there was just such an overwhelming amount of interest, especially during budget season and over the summer as these protests were going on, um, that I think it's important, you know, I think people are interested in where things are at and want to be checking in on like where things go. So if you're curious about this, we have several stories up about it. And you know, write to your city councilor, you know, they, they are evidently still at work on this and can give you like a good update on where things are at. Thanks for that update. Sure. Um, and then the, the last item that we were going to talk about was uh, kind of the school reopening calendar. And there's, there's things related to COVID with that, but there's also things related to construction with the high school. Um, what do you know about that, Julia? Sure. Um, so I think you know, this, um, the news on this keeps changing. Um, so I have been kind of diligently covering school committee, which is I think every two weeks. Um, and I think, you know, God, it, it's hard to speak about this because there's so many things at play. You know, there's, um, you know, back in the fall, the city decided to undertake a really um, ambitious HVAC kind of construction and update plan um, across the district. So the new high school is is being built already to meet these it was being built already to meet these HVAC infiltration standards um but construction was still underway and then they kind of analyzed all of the different school buildings determined that some like the brown school for example would be pretty like nearly impossible to rehabilitate kind of with immediacy um and have been working on you know updating the Argentiano, the Capuano, Healy like all of these schools um you know, installing portable filters in some cases to allow for some kind of short-term use. Um, but this work is taking a long time. Um, so kind of as we've seen, um, and I am no I am no buildings expert. 
I will say that up front. Um, I just have been, you know, following the school committee meetings and, you know, paying attention to um, Rich Rages, who is the uh, director of infrastructure and asset management, paying attention to his presentations. This stuff is really complicated. Um, and, you know, I'll be the first to say that I don't necessarily understand every piece of it, but um, he, he speaks often about risk and the different kinds of risks that you undertake when you when you have a construction project, there's always risk associated um, with, you know, um, getting materials on time. For example, there was a lot of, when they were trying to get these filters, these MERV filters, um, everyone else was also trying to get the filters because other people are doing the same thing and trying to update their filtration system. So there were lead time issues that's an example of a risk. There's always a risk when you're doing construction and you open up the walls and you don't necessarily know what you're gonna find. So if you find another problem, you have to fix it before you can continue with the work that was already established. Right. So these are examples of some of the problems that have, I, th I think, come up according to Raish and these presentations, which has been delaying some of this work. Um, so, you know, things have continued being pushed back, you know, for, for whatever reason, you know, if initially it seemed that some school buildings would be open in December, that quickly changed. Then it seemed like it might be the beginning of January after Christmas break or the holiday break and that changed. And um, the latest information is that I think the earliest occupancy um, for the high school is February 22nd. Um, and that is an optimistic date. I think the pessimistic date is like March 15th um in terms of like when work stops but then it takes time for the district to notify families to make sure teachers can move their stuff because some teachers are going to be in an entirely different school than they're used to teaching these students because it's just when things become available so there are a lot of factors here um you know parents you know a, a lot of parents are expressing frustration especially parents of um, students who have special education needs um at the same time, I was speaking with Ben Ishavaria of the Welcome Project, who, you know, they do a lot of liaising with immigrant parents. Um, they're based in East Somerville as well in the Mystic Projects and have more contact with those residents. And he has said that, you know, COVID, as we just saw in those maps, has disproportionately impacted those populations. And many of those parents aren't necessarily, you know, they would love for their child to be in school, but they're also, they're very nervous. You know, their, their communities have been severely impacted by this and aren't necessarily in a hot rush to send their students to an unsafe situation. So there are many, many opinions on this. Um, this the teachers are a factor. There are ongoing negotiations with the Somerville Educators Union in terms of what they need to see to feel safe to come back. Um, so, you know, so the building construction, the teachers, the parents, um, the timelines, like, there's a lot, there's a lot going on here. Um, so I would just say this to, to just, you know, remind the community that, you know, we continue to cover this. Things keep changing things, you know, between Monday's school committee and Tuesday's school reopening town hall, timelines shifted a little bit. Um, you know, I'm gonna continue to pay attention to this um, and please, you know, come to me with concerns and questions and I'm happy to ask them. Um, but I think this is just something we have to continue kind of seeing how, how it rolls out. Absolutely. Well, thank you for joining me on this, uh, our, our bi-weekly, monthly news roundup, re our regular <laughs> news roundup. <laughs> uh, Julia Taliesin from the Somerville Journal. You can visit uh, somerville.wickedlocal.com to check out the Somerville Journal's offerings, articles, read in depth the, the articles by Julia that she mentioned on the program. And also uh, don't forget to visit somervillemedia.org uh, to check out a video of this program, as well as some other Somerville Neighborhood News videos. For uh, Somerville Media Center, I'm Dave Ortega. Thank you very much, Julia Taliesin. Thank you.